Good morning, uh, good afternoon and good evening and welcome to the second webinar uh, series uh, on the series on debating challenges for minority protection. My name is Kiriaki Topidi and I am the Senior Research Associate on Culture and Diversity at the European Center for Minority Issues in Germany. It is my great pleasure uh, and privilege to be moderating today's event. Um, Today, our topic is um, focusing on the critical challenges of tackling hate speech, xenophobic rhetoric, and incitement to hatred against minorities. Uh, as mentioned, this is the second event, uh, and the series is organized and co-hosted by the Tom Lantosh Institute, the School of Advanced Studies uh, of the University of London, and is also under the patronage of the Office of the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. Um, today, our topic unfolds as follows. Uh, we are looking at hate speech, xenophobic rhetoric, and incitement to hatred against minorities, including on social media. This is because this is one of the thematic priorities chosen by the Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, but it also reflects initiatives on hate speech spearheaded by the UN as Secretary General. At the 2020 regional um, forums on UN Forum uh, on Minority Issues, this significant and timely uh, topic will be discussed. What we are looking to focus on today is to highlight the significance of the promotion and protection of the human rights of minorities in combating these practices. So the aim of the webinar is to identify the issues, patterns and impacts of hate speech and of course exp explore appropriate um, responses. Uh, to do so, we are joined by a very diverse and exciting um, group of uh, scholars and also um, activists. Uh, and the first of which is Dr. Julius Rostas, who is a visiting professor at the National School of Political Science and Administration in Bucharest and the Central Uni European University. Uh, Ms. Licia Brooks, uh, who is a Chief Workplace Transformation Officer at the Southern Poverty Law Center. Then we have Ms. Nikhat Dad, who is the Executive Director of the Digital Rights Foundation, uh, followed by Dr. Sajal Parmar, who is a lecturer at the School of Law at the University of Sheffield. Uh, we also have with us the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, Dr. Fernanda Varen. So um, with that in mind, I welcome you, all of you and our audience. Uh, the point of and the structure of the uh, webinar is uh, includes also audience participants. So we uh, encourage those of you that have joined us today to submit questions to the panelists. Uh, ideally, we would hope that these questions would be targeted towards a specific speaker and if possible, clearly linked to the topic of our discussion. Uh, questions should be submitted during the speaker's presentation. And of course, you also have the possibility to submit them later. Uh, as you can imagine, due to time restrictions, uh, we may not be uh, it may not be possible for us to respond to all questions, but uh, all questions will be nevertheless collated and shared with the offices of the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, as well as the OSCE High Commissioner on National Minorities. So, uh, with that in mind, I would like to invite our speakers to consider the following question. Assuming that you are at the virtual meeting of the UN Forum on Minority Issues, if you were making your intervention now, at this moment uh, in time, what would be the key issues that you would raise on the topic? And if possible, having made that intervention, what actions would you like to see the international organizations take on to, to begin addressing those issues? So uh, with this double-edged sword, I invite uh, Dr. Julius Rosas to give us his overview of these three crucial uh, key issues in his opinion with respect to his, to his home country, Romania. Thank you. Hello, everyone. In my presentation today, I'm going to develop three main points. The first one is the inadequacy of minority protection system to effectively protect Roma against hate speech 
as revealed also by the COVID-19 pandemic in Romania and other countries. The second point is the need to have a larger conceptual frame for minority protection, such as social justice, to effectively address structural racism, discrimination, and discrimination, including hate speech. And the third point is a brief analysis of the Romanian legal framework and protection against hate speech, how it is applied uh, to Roma. So let me start with the first point, the inadequacy of minority protection to effectively protect Roma. Hate speech against Roma is an everyday occurrence, so it's not something abnormal. However, since COVID-19 lockdown, the public discourse on Roma has exhibited unacceptable levels of racism towards Roma all over Europe. While there have been protest movements against racism and colonialism all over Europe and all over the world, the racism and state violence directed against Roma in European societies has almost entirely been neglected as a sign of uh, um, uh, uh, hypocrisy we had European leaders claiming that Europe is doing much better uh, than US when it comes to racism, ignoring the fact that Europeans were at the roots of uh, colonial, power, uh, uh, colonial uh, uh, conquer of the rest of the world and um, generated uh, power structures impregnated with racism and uh, domination. The ethnicization of pandemic uh, is a, a feature of what went on in the last few months in Europe. Roma were the main responsible for spreading the disease according to many social actors, politicians, law enforcement agencies, TV stations and social media alike framed the Roma as the source and the main vehicle in spreading the disease, although scientific arguments proved uh, uh, not quite so. Law enforcement, especially, that sporadically was policing Roma communities before the pandemic, now showed up a significant, in significant numbers to isolate these communities using force and sending a clear message to the society that the Roma communities represent a significant danger for uh, the rest of uh, the population. Just one example. Uh, following an incident in Bolintin, a village in South Romania around 40 kilometers from Bucharest, where police forces beat and tortured Roma men that were on their property and having a grill in their garden during the lockdown, three Roma activists had a meeting with the leadership of the Romanian police. The identified solution was that Roma activists should assist the police in isolating Roma communities. So uh, they, the, the Romanian police leadership did not see any problem in tens of cases of violence uh, reported against Roma individuals and communities. Not at all. Their only concern was absolute um, control of these communities. This is not uh, uh, only specific to Romania. Similar incidents have been reported all over Europe, both in Central and Eastern Europe, but also in Western Europe. I'll go on to the second point, the need to have a larger consensual frame for minority protection. Minority rights are perceived by many as a benefit or extra rights for minorities. The recent COVID-19 pandemic revealed that social justice is not just a benefit for the marginalized, but rather a public good for the whole society. Social inequalities become more oppressive during the pandemic. Poverty, lack of access to services and public goods such as water and basic infrastructure, combined with the restriction on the labor uh, market and free movement, further exacerbates 
the existing social inequalities. In order to ensure minimum subsistence for their families, members of the marginalized groups, such as Roma, are indirectly forced to break these restrictions. In addition, they are portrayed by law enforcement agencies as a social danger and those that spread the disease. Thus, during the pandemic, inequalities and racism become significant challenges for the entire society, not only for the marginalized groups. The institutions established as part of the minority norms and orders were not designed to have decision-making power in significant decision-making power in the redistribution of resources. These bodies and institutions fail to remove structural inequalities and effectively address centuries old racism towards Roma. Thus, the current framework for minority protection does not address, for example, structural racism and discrimination that certain minority groups such as Roma have suffered for centuries. Let's not forget that Roma have been enslaved in what is today Romania for more than 500 years. So inspired by the debates generated by the situation of indigenous people and the need to protect their rights, UN could open up a debate for placing minority protection in a larger conceptual frame, such as social justice, yeah? such, uh, where social justice becomes a public good for the whole society. Now, let me move briefly to the third point. Uh, and here is a short analysis of the legal framework uh, um, protecting against hate speech in Romania. So under the le Romanian legal framework, hate speech might fall under the discrimination law or the penal law. The scope under the discrimination law, the scope is so large that dilutes the sense of uh, um, discrimination and hate speech. For example, the formulation, any behavior that is an offense to dignity or create an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating, or offensive atmosphere against a person, group, or community. Now, that this sounds uh, um, a formulation that covers a broad areas of uh, um, behavior. However, when it was applied, besides the politicization of the uh, uh, specialized equality body that was supposed to apply it, led to inefficiency. Instead of focusing on important issues when it comes to hate speech, due to politicization, some politicians were uh, 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 penalized under, under anti-discrimination law, while others were considered free speech or received just um, a, a minor uh, penalty. When it comes to the penal law, we have incitement to racial and ethnic hatred, denial of Holocaust, and glorification of war criminals. So in spite of uh, uh, having these provisions for more than 10 years, so far, there is no prosecution under the penal law. And this is, of course, not because in Romania there is no hate speech, but because the prosecution failed to investigate and to bring to law before the court uh, anyone that uh, uh, did that. Just recently, in the last 10 days, we had uh, uh, um, uh, an event somewhere in Northern Romania, where a statue of the um, war criminal, the Romanian leader under the, um, during the Second World War and an ally of Hitler, his statue was revealed on a private property in Romania. Now we are aware that many countries or many groups are trying to avoid uh, um, coming uh, out and they place such statutes on private property. However, the event was public, was uh, transmitted live on social media, and there were local notabilities and media participating. So um, no incident and the prosecution didn't start an investigation there. 
just yesterday, a major newspaper in Romania is, was announcing that it's gonna sell for the next two weeks, a book on written by a war criminal about the Romanian leader who was also a war criminal during the Second World War, who deported Jews and Roma, and who, ki who is responsible for the killing of almost 300,000 Jews and Roma Romanian citizens. No prosecution so far has happened in the past 10 years. So uh, we are having experiencing a situation where the state fails to protect uh, um, the rights of its own citizens, and then relying on um, international uh, organizations such as UN proved also not very efficient. I'll stop here and I'll be very glad to answer any questions uh, further on. Thank, Thank, you. You, Thank you, Dr. Rosas. Um, this is very helpful uh, and it begins uh, in a very dynamic way our discussion and exchange here. Um, can I remind the audience that if you do wish to ask questions directly to Dr. Uh, Rosas, please don't hesitate to use the Zoom chat function to do so. And um, can I now turn to our second distinguished speaker who is uh, Alicia Brooks and invite her to give us um, a sense of the three key issues that she wishes to highlight in respect to the US. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone. Thanks for this opportunity to be with you. And thank you, Dr. Rosas. I really uh, appreciated your presentation. Thank you. Uh, I'd also like to make three main points or three key points um, today. The first being the enduring legacy of white supremacy in the US. The second, the impact of a rising white nationalist movement in black, indigenous, and people of color communities. And lastly, hate speech as a constitutionally protected right in the US. So as everyone is aware, we're in a, we're in a, a moment of, of inflection or in the US where we're beginning to reckon with our history of white supremacy in the, in the US. It's an enduring legacy that, as you're aware, goes back to our nation's founding, um, beginning with the, the US genocide and, and the ongoing subjugation of indigenous peoples, continuing through the enslavement of, of African Americans and this, the establishment of this false narrative of white superiority and um, the inferiority of black folks or anyone who is not white. I mention this because it's a, it's a legacy that continues with us to this present day. The enslavement and systemic and cultural acceptance of the inferiority of anyone that is not white um, is present today and throughout all of our systems. As the previous speaker mentioned, um, in the era of COVID-19, some of those inequalities or inequities and, and discrepancies um, or disparities rather between white people who identify as white and those who are people of color were laid bare. We saw these systemic disparities throughout the, the educational system, through our health system, um, in, in the ways that, that police violence increased, all of the things that the previous speaker, speaker mentioned. Uh, I'd like to, to mention uh, Brian Stevenson the founder and the executive director of the Equal Justice Initiative also in Montgomery, Alabama, who really lays this, this theory out for us. He talks about the rationalization for the acceptance of chattel slavery in the US as being dependent upon this false narrative of white superiority and black inferiority. And I know that I, I'm aware that I keep mentioning that, but it's a, it's a point that needs to be made and needs to be accepted if we are ever to do anything to push back on this cont continued oppression of people of color communities in the US. Um, Post-emancipation or uh, the so-called freedom of, of African-Americans in the US quickly morphed into the establishment of, of black folks as dangerous and guilty. We saw that in the creation of the Black Codes and then in, in Jim Crow laws that continued um, the systemic oppression of Black communities. 
We see that today in our uh, criminal justice system. Again, Mr. Stevenson's narrative of from, math, from enslavement to mass incarceration is a through line in our society that, that remains present. As we're seeing in the present moment through the Black Lives Matter movement that began in earnest post um, uh, the Zimmerman uh, verdict of not guilty in the killing of Trayvon Martin, something that has continued across the US to this day that has really taken hold um, after the public lynching of Mr. George Floyd, has really um, begun a movement where people are beginning to see and to recognize the infrastructure, the structures that continue to uphold white supremacy in our society. So today we find ourselves, and we shouldn't be surprised that anti-blackness is something that is, 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 is present and permeates throughout every structure in society. So if we talk about, if we're talking about the challenges to, to tracking hate speech, xenophobia, and xenophobic rhetoric and the incitement of hatred against minority communities, of course, we shouldn't be surprised that the, the, the biggest challenge of all is our ongoing legacy of systemic uh, racism and oppression. The second point I'd like to make is the impact of rising the rising white nationalist movement um, against Blacks, Indigenous people, and other, you know, people of color communities and other marginalized communities. As some may know, the Southern Poverty Law Center is part of our work to track and monitor hate and extremist groups and activity in the US. Part of that work is to conduct an annual census of all of the active hate groups that exist in the US. Our most recent reporting on 2019 revealed 940 active hate groups in the US. That's a slight drop um, but we shouldn't uh, take any solace in that because hate and extremism is definitely a, alive and well in the US. The only reason that it dropped is because there was some um, discord and disarray amongst two major white nationalist or white supremacist movements, notably the nationalist socialist movement and then another movement led by um, a man named Matthew Heimbach. Should also note that as we as we track and monitor the activity of, of physical hate groups, we also note an increasing increase, an increase rather in uh, online radicalization. People no longer need to join physical groups. They can connect um, in the US and across, and, and across borders with people um, who, who have like beliefs. I should note that um, our census showed an increase of 55% in the number of white nationalist hate groups. And that is, is as significant as it sounds. Um, ever since the, um, well, starting with the campaign, when, when now President Trump began his, his presidential campaign, he started out on a note of xenophobia um, dehumanizing Latinx community members and continues to do so to this very day. Um, the white nationalist movement has been energized by this um, president's administration. We find people who, who uh, hold and uphold white nationalist um, uh, speaking points and beliefs these, these individuals have been present in the Trump administration since the very beginning. If we wanna look at xeno, xenophobia in the White House and how it comes out of the Trump administration, we need look no further than Stephen Miller who's responsible for the Muslim ban, for um, caging Latinx children and families and the ongoing um, war against uh, migrants and immigrants and, and, the, and, our, and our, our dismal um, just, I just atrocious record of, of not accepting refugees into the US. I also want to note that there was a 35% increase in the number of active hate groups that, that we identify as anti LGBTQ. As we look at and these things go hand in hand, typically, um, people who espouse a, um, a white supremacist ideology are also anti Semitic, anti LGBT, anti kind of anything that isn't within their frame or understanding of, um, you know, whiteness. So um, 
I wanted to also bring that to the current mo moment. And there's been a lot of talk about how how these white na how the na white nationalist movement has been working to infiltrate the movement of Black Lives Matters and to um, capitalize on this 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 moment we're experiencing in the U.S. There's been a lot of primarily on online chatter um, amongst these white supremacist groups, and some have showed up at some rallies. Um, what we need to understand is that these groups thrive on on chaos and try to capitalize on um, events or political political events that are happening within the U.S. There's a there's a group that has come to be known as the Boogaloo's who um, are advocating for a civil war. They're not in our mind identified as a hate group yet because they just kind of appeared over the last year, but they do um, sow chaos and and are promoting violence. There's another group, um, a white nationalist group known as Accelerationist, who do. Um, advocate violence and are um, hoping to encourage uh, a race war. And they would do this by um, sowing chaos. You may have heard from the Trump administration this false narrative that, that Antifa um, is disrupting these movements and, and that is just blatantly false. Antifa and anti-fascist group that um, are also against white supremacy and, and, and anti they're an anti-racist group. So that's happening. The third, third, third point I think that is, is particularly pertinent to, to this discussion is that hate speech is a constitutionally protected right in the US, which <laughs> that's probably the number one challenge to um, tracking and monitoring the situation. Um, our, the US Supreme Court settled some, some years ago, back in the 1970s, I'll read this quote, under the First Amendment, there is no such thing as a false idea. However pernicious, pernicious an opinion may seem, we depend for its correction, not on the conscience of judges and juries, but on the competition of ideas. And this was a case that was settled in, in 1974. And so this is what we're fighting against. Uh, if we can't depend on the conscience of, of judges or juries to identify what is and what is not hate speech and what is dangerous to society and, and have to depend upon the competition of ideas within the context of white supremacist culture, you can imagine that um, who's gonna be on the winning and the losing side of that. I will say that hate crimes are constitutional if, they're puni if they punish violence or vandalism, but hate crimes, a very, very difficult thing to prove because you have to prove that the primary motivation um, in whole or in part was based on bias against a protected class. So those protected classes being race, gender, um, religion, nationality, and not always sexual orientation or sexual identity. So it's very, very difficult to prove the motivation for the commission of a crime. So um, there are some incidents where protected speech, um, where speech is not protected rather, and that's when um, the speaker is calling for or inciting immediate violence or um, making threats of violence. Those are, not, those are not constitutionally protected acts. But again, to prove that the motivation was biased based on a protected class is a difficult thing to do. Lastly, and I just want, I just want to mention the Stop the Hate for Profit campaign that just launched yesterday, whereby uh, many uh, social justice groups are, are not advertising on Facebook. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Brooks. <laughs> that was great. Um, again, if our audience wishes to ask questions um, to Ms. Brooks, feel free to do so. And don't hesitate to also share with us your thoughts over the chat. Um, so now I turn to Ms. Nick Haddad, who uh, is uh, supposed to give us her three key issues or challenges from the point of view uh, of the Pakistani reality. So um, please, Nick Haddad, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for uh, having me here. Um, I'll be uh, I'll be giving a little bit background and also uh, because like the 
uh, when we contextualize the hate speech against minorities in Pakistan, it's very, very complex. So there are like three things that I would love, uh, the, the three issues that I would like to talk about. And maybe later we can look into uh, how international organizations like UN uh, can address uh, the complex issues that the minorities are facing here. Um, one is hate speech against minorities. Uh, it goes unchecked uh, online and offline. Uh, the second one is that in Pakistan, public takes justice into their own hands, which is mob justice. Um, and how usually authorities does not uh, control this. And the third one is uh, persecution of minority population makes it harder for them to speak out. And even speaking out for them has repercussions offline and online. So uh, going to the first one, uh, restrictive is a restricted speech laws particularly impact minority groups and their ability to exercise their freedom of expression. We have already heard that from our previous speakers. Um, and I would like to talk about, you know, like the laws such as like blasphemy law or cybercrime law in Pakistan. They are applied unevenly when it comes to minorities. Uh, and it could be religious minorities, sexual minorities. Uh, and to be very honest, I also consider women minority in, in my country also. Although we, are, we make half of the uh, population, uh, we, have, we have 200 million uh, people here and half of them are women. And I call them minority because of the uh, way, uh, you know, the, their rights are being violated and they don't have equal rights, although it's, those are in in the constitution. Um, in online spaces, websites for some religious minority uh, groups are also banned in Pakistan. So while on one hand, speech of minority groups is restricted, hate campaigns against minority groups are left completely unchecked. Hate campaigns regarding religious minorities carried out in an organized manner. Uh, or again, offline and online. And so in offline, it's like, through stickers, for instance, stickers are placed on buses, stickers or posters, wall chalking, distribution of pamphlets. And in online space, it's like hashtags on Twitter uh, or pay, uh, pages on Facebook. So these campaigns are met with complete inaction by the authorities, despite the fact that they present a clear and present dan danger to individuals and the community at large through incitement to violence. Uh, this hate speech is often covered by the media, but the legitimacy of such statements is rarely questioned, nor is the perspective of the targeted community represented. Regulators in electronic and online media fail to address hate speech against minorities. We had just recently there was this uh, uh, hashtag uh, um, and um, it trended in Pakistan for several hours against one minority community, yet no action was taken by the state and also by the social media companies also, although this hashtag was reported to Twitter several times. One reason was that the hashtag was in Urdu, in, in our uh, local language. Um, and uh, minority voices are also, uh, I mean, to, uh, talking about the mainstream media, the voices are almost non-existent. Uh, they are mostly invisible in the, uh, in the dominant media, TV and radio, which carry very little or, or no coverage. Hindus and Christian communities are the focus of almost of, of, uh, all of what little coverage of religious minorities is available, while other minorities such as Ahmadis, Sikh, Buddhist, Kailash, Hazaras get almost no coverage. One th third of the coverage about religious minorities is actually not about them and only a reference to them by others. The second one is the mob justice. So intolerance in, in society has often driven, driven individuals to take matters into, into their own hands in the form of vigilantes who seek to kill by and large members of minor, uh, minority groups or any advocates associated with them. Since 1990, at least 62 people have been murdered by vigilantes as a result of mere, mere blasphemy allegations before any trial could place. Despite the strict Supreme Court ruling on the subject, the danger of vigilante killings has not abated. Um, and minority groups are often denied proper representation in government. And the government has, has often back, backtracked on decisions to put members of minority groups in key positions. In like, our, our constitution, by the way, also says that a non-Muslim cannot become a president of the country. Uh, the third one is the persecution of minority population makes it 
harder for them to speak out and even speaking out for them has repercussions um enforced disappearances of hazara shia community members simply because of their religious identity um according to one report uh, an estimated 144 of shias are missing across pakistan the abducted shias are accused of fighting for iran in syria and iraq however the authorities have failed to produce any evidence in courts first community to be tar targeted for enforced dis uh, disappearances simply because of their religious beliefs political activists have historically been be, uh, been targeted um and then you know if and then there is a layer of vulnerability here when you know you are a woman from a minority community so they are if they use online spaces they are often silenced by harassment uh the slut shaming uh men taking their pictures editing them onto bodies of naked women and then blackmailing them there was this case of uh, a woman called anila farmer she committed suicide after blackmailers broke off uh two of her engagements by sending edited pictures of her dem uh, demand demanding 15000 rupees every month um and then we have prevention of electronic crimes act so cyber crime uh it was passed in 2016 uh once it was passed there were four secular bloggers and activists uh many of whom who who were running some facebook pages were abducted in january 2017 and after being released they revealed stories of tortures uh torture at the hands of you know uh, uh of different authorities so i think they're like these uh online and offline uh, uh uh instances of hate speech uh where you know we see that the laws are there to protect everyone because every, everyone is equal, equal in the eyes of the constitution but then how the people are being treated i think that's where the problem lies and i'll be talking about some positive developments that are also happening uh now um maybe we'll we'll uh, we'll be talking about that the, uh, about those in um, later uh, of our session thank you very much and thank you very much for sticking in to your 10 minute slot i really appreciate that uh for those of you that do have questions for ms dad uh, please again uh, do not hesitate to use our zoom chat function and then allow me to um turn to our penultimate speaker, which is Dr. Sujal Parmar, and invite her to give us three issues, but this time from an international perspective on hate speech. The floor is yours, Sujal. Thanks very much, Kiriaki, and my thanks to the organizers for um, this fascinating uh, panel discussion on what is uh, clearly a, a very pressing subject. Um, so um, there hasn't been um, more interest or more energy specifically directed to addressing hate speech at the global level than there is now, I think. Speaking as an academic um, on international human rights law, these are um, extraordinary and fascinating times. And as a human rights activist, um, there, this is also a time of opportunity, given this interest, including now from the Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues. So what I will do um, is also threefold. First, I'll unpack and highlight the relevancy of the international human rights law approach um, to addressing hate speech, particularly with respect to minorities. Then I'll identify what challenges there are to the implementation of that international human rights law approach. And finally, I'll look at how and what social media companies should do, um, even though they are not directly the subjects of international human rights law themselves, to address hate speech. So at the international level, there has been a great flurry of activity in the last um, year or so. A number of Concrete texts have been adopted by key UN actors. First, um, last uh, June, June 2019, the UN Secretary General's Strategy and Plan of Action on Hate Speech was adopted. Then in October last year, the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression presented his report on online hate speech to the General Assembly. And finally, um, just in May um, uh, this year, um, the um, UN's guidance note on addressing and countering COVID-19 related hate speech was released. These initiatives and the conversations around and subsequent to them, including with social media companies, um, respond to very concerns around hate speech. And um, this um, concern has been intensified, obviously, because of the awareness of COVID-19 related hate speech and the disparate impact of um, the pandemic on uh, minorities. 
Um, and also in the last month or so, this amazing um, both US national, but also global awakening concerning systemic racism and relatedly intensifying civil society pressure, both in the US and also internationally on tech and social media companies to address this phenomenon. So just in the last days, um, as um, Litsia um, uh, suggested, we have seen um, an advertising boycott of Facebook and other social media companies by some of the biggest corporations, including Unilever, Ford, Adidas, Honda, Microsoft, and others, after pressure by the Stop for Hate um, uh, for Profit, sorry, Stop Hate for Profit global campaign. And Facebook has gone on to ban violent groups associated with the extremist Boogaloo network. Um, just in the last few days. And um, the um, platform has also gone on the public defensive again with uh, senior officials saying that they are getting better and are not complacent about stopping hate speech online. So before I return to the issue of social media companies, I'd just like to focus on those um, more recent initiatives and the international human rights law framework. How are those recent initiatives um, and that legal framework relevant to uh, addressing hate speech, especially against persons belonging to minorities. In defining hate speech for the first time in the UN system, the UN strategy and plan of action expressly concedes this term as meaning, that is hate speech as meaning any kind of communication that attacks or uses pejorative or discriminatory language with reference to a person or a group on the basis of who they are based on a number of grounds, including religion, ethnicity, nationality, race, color, descent, gender, or other identity factor. Um, so this is a very broad um, definition of hate speech, which encompasses, um, I think, um, minority um, um, groups. Um, then the guidance notes on COVID-19 related hate speech very clearly states that um, it is motivated by evidence of scapegoating, stereotyping, stigmatization and vilification of certain individuals, particularly those perceived as Chinese or Asian, but also individuals belonging to certain ethnic or religious, religious minorities, um, as well as migrants, follow, uh, foreigners and others. But these very um, recent um, texts adopted in the last year are not binding um, on um, states. Um, so I think it's very important when understanding the actual legal protection um, um, uh, afforded to minorities in relation to hate speech to look at that international uh, legal framework. So what does that say? It is critical to note that there is no legal definition of hate speech in international law. It is a very vague concept um, um, and uh, can easily be manipulated, often to suppress legitimate speech. Um, the Secretary General Strategy and Action Plan has a non-legal definition, which clearly covers both lawful and unlawful speech. Um, so international law indicates, um, and I'm summarizing the, the framework here, that states and other actors should respond to different types of hate speech differently. So I like to see this as three levels of hate speech. At the top level, the severest kind of hate speech should be prohibited. Such expressions include direct and public incitement to genocide um, as defined by international criminal law, and also any advocacy of national, racial, or religious hatred that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility, or violence, um, which is the key provision concerning the concept which is closest to um, a notion of hate speech, which is incitement. Um, and that key provision is Article 20 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So according to these international standards, um, uh, uh, what does incitement mean? So incitement has um, been elaborated on by a text called the Rabat Plan of Action. Um, and that says that um, in assessing whether um, incitement is severe enough to constitute a criminal offense, um, a judgment has to be made um, as to whether it fulfills all six um, criteria in what is known as the threshold test. So this is a, a very high threshold. So uh, prosecutors and judges should take account of, of these criteria in assessing whether um, uh, expression, hateful expression should be criminalized. So these criteria are the context of expression, its speaker, their intent, 
its content and form, its extent and magnitude, and the likelihood um, of um, inciting actual action against the targeted group. So um, those six criteria are actually quite important because I think they present a framework for assessing whether, um, or, or rather um, for assessing the severity of any kind of speech which we might call hate speech. So, um, and I think that those criteria are being um, drawn upon um, by um, uh, UN actors, but also uh, civil society organizations and um, even um, um, uh, slowly um, tech companies. So at the intermediate level, certain, form of hate, certain forms of hate speech may, pre, may be prohibited, even if they do not reach the threshold of incitement. So certain types of bias discrimination may be restricted if they are provided by law, pursue a legitimate aim, such as protecting the rights of others, such as equality and non-discrimination, and are deemed as being necessary in a democratic society and proportionate. So, um, for example, threats of violence or identity-based harassment, especially in the run-up to elections, may be restricted if they meet this test. And finally, the third and bottom level of hate speech are expressions which constitute um, the least severe forms of hate speech, um, expressions which should not be restricted. Indeed, they, they, they must be allowed from an international human rights law perspective. So, these types of speech include expression that is offensive, shocking or disturbing, the condoning or denial of historical events, um, including crimes of genocide, blasphemous speech, insult to religious feelings, um, uh, lack of respect for religion or um, uh, uh, belief systems, uh, and defamation of religions. But that does not mean that such expressions um, do not warrant attention because they can clearly have um, an impact um, upon um, the culture in a society and, and um, patterns of discrimination and inequality. So policies and practices and measures nurturing social consciousness and promoting intergroup understanding are necessary and are indeed mandated by international um, human rights law. So there should be um, uh, the creation of an enabling environment for the exercise of freedom of expression um, and effective measures in the fields of teaching, education, culture, and information with a view to combating uh, prejudices, as well as the engagement of relevant stakeholders, including state actors, um, political leaders, civil society, and the private sector to tackle the root causes of prejudice and intolerance. So as you see that the international human rights law framework does present a, a nuanced and complex approach to this very broad amorphous and vague notion of hate speech. Okay, turning now to um, the second um, point which um, concerns the challenges or threats um, to the implementation of this international human rights framework. I've just highlighted three. The first is the willful and flagrant violation of this framework by states. Um, so the severest forms of hate speech have been identified as a precursor to atrocity crimes, including genocide in many situations from Rwanda to Bosnia to Cambodia and most recently Myanmar but they can also lead to a range of lesser harms um, across societies, laying the foundation for violence, undermining social cohesion, setting back the cause of um, uh, peace, sust uh, stability, sustainable developments and human rights, um, or because states just don't take their legal obligations seriously. Um, relatedly, and I think we see this, especially in the last um, five years or so, the combination of hate speech and disinformation about persons belonging to minorities has been driven by individual political leaders, um, particularly around the time of elections to cause division, um, polarize the societies in the hope that hatred will be a vote winner. Um, and the final issue um, that I uh, should highlight in terms of threats is that um, as a, as a number of speakers have already highlighted, hate speech um, by individuals and groups is enabled and amplified exponentially through platforms, often targeting women um, and minorities, and is often linked with um, disinformation. Um, Facebook um, played um, in to create a, an environment for the incitement of violence and ethnic cleansing in Myanmar that forced 
more than uh, 700,000 Rohingya to flee the country as refugees. Um, so th that is just the first um, or, or sort of most egregious example um, um, that has um, been um, highlighted um, uh, globally. Um, okay. So turning now to my third point, how should tech companies and social media platforms... Bajal, can I ask yeah. you to wrap up, please? Sure. Because we're running over time. Thank you. Sure. So I should just say that um, tech companies and social media platforms um, have responsibilities, but they really need to explicitly integrate international human rights standards concerning hate speech into their policies, um, not only because of it harms their business interests, but also on the basis of principle. So um, this is absolutely key to... Um, addressing hate speech um, in a digital age. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for a quite comprehensive overview of the international framework. Um, now I would like to invite uh, the UN Special Rapporteur on Minority Issues, Dr. Fernando Varen, to give us um, a feeling of his observations and reflections in relation to the key challenges highlighted by the speakers. And just a reminder, if anyone needs to uh, uh, ask any questions to Sajal, please use the, the Zoom chat function to do so. The floor is yours, Dr. De, De Varen. Thank you, Kiriaki. Hello, everyone. Uh, first, congratulations to Tom Lantos Institute and the Human Rights Consortium of the University of London, Anna Maria, Karine, and all of your team members for organizing what, well, what's a much needed and welcome series of webinars on debating challenges for minority protection, including, well, this uh, very, very specific uh, one today on hate speech, social media, and minorities. And I'd like to also express my appreciation for the rich contributions of, by the four expert speakers, Julius, Alicia, uh, Nigat, and Sejal. Uh, as some of you know, hate speech and so uh, social media and minorities is the thematic priority of, uh, of my mandate this year. And we will be dealing with this issue, these issues, with two regional forums. We will hopefully Behave, be having later this year, one which is expected in Vienna for Europe in uh, September, hopefully, and another one in Kuala Lumpur for Asia Pacific, pandemic permitting, of course. So in addition, um, this year's United Nations Forum on Minority Issues will also be on this topic and um, will be held in mid-November at the Palais des Nations in Geneva, in Switzerland. So I hope to present, by the way, not only a report on hate speech and minorities based on these activities, but also to develop guidelines that highlights the extent that this is first and perhaps foremost a minority issue. And I'll come back to that actually perhaps in just a few moments. Um, I have some observations on the key points which stand out from what I've just heard from the guest speakers. Um, and the, perhaps some of the questions and responses will also provide fuel for others. Um, but uh, what I actually would like to raise is on the one hand, the disproportionate extent of hate speech in social media target minorities and, to need to, and the need to address the complexities and dangers in balancing freedom of expression against hate speech in, in social media, because I, we have to. In fact, this is perhaps the core question of where is this balance? How do we identify it? And how do we deal with it effectively? Um, first, we need data. We need disaggregated data on the extent minorities are the main targets of hate speech in social media. And um, because social media right now seems to be providing fertile ground for this, the dissemination of racism and xenophobia, as well as vilification, scapegoating, and dehumanizing of minorities. And by the way, we also have through social media even calls uh, to genocide still occurring today. And just to give you what perhaps one uh, obvious example of the, the relevance and importance of addressing hate speech in social media, and I think Julius uh, mentioned this amongst others, you have minorities such as the Roma in some European countries and others such as Muslims also in India who are being blamed for spreading the COVID-19 virus. And this is adding fuel to existing patterns of hate and exclusion that exacerbates the inequalities minorities 
uh, such as these experience in many parts of the world. Uh, the, um, the reason data is important uh, is that we need to identify to measure the scope, the scale of minorities being targeted in social media by hate speech. And this is not always obvious. Uh, a few countries have data available, I think in the United Kingdom, uh, which, where we see a suggestion that more than three quarters of hate crimes target those we know as ethnic, religious, and linguistic minorities. Numerous non-governmental organizations in different countries suggest similar skills, that the vast proportion, and I insist, the vast proportion of those vulnerable to hate speech are, first and foremost, again, minorities. Um, but we also are seeing it's, uh, situations where authorities um, do, are not identifying this systematically. Many countries actually do not or refuse to, um, to uh, obtain information on who are actually being targeted by hate speech. So in many places, we do not have disaggregated data. And this hides, in my opinion, in hides a degree where minorities are the main victims. And this would seem to be actually an increasing phenomenon around the world. But if we don't have specific data, uh, it becomes very difficult to talk about this in a clear way. So it's a, this is a point which uh, was raised more or less directly in some of the uh, presentations, but which I think needs cold, hard facts to clearly demonstrate the skill, the scale which we are dealing with if we are to take this more seriously at the United Nations, and if we're going to try to pressure states to collect this kind of information in order to recognize and effectively tackle what I have called previously a disease of the mind, which is propagating much too much uh, throughout the different populations. So I was hoping, for example, that the four experts could have, uh, could have perhaps indicated the proportion of hate speech, which targets minorities in the US Romania, Pakistan, and the United Kingdom. Um, I do have some information on those elements, but actually it's surprising sometimes how much we do not have ready access to this. But to come back to the main point, um, and I really want to emphasize this, and we need to reflect on this. Can you imagine any other area of human rights protection? where possibly more than three quarters of the victims belong to a particular segment of the population. And we, I have to admit, at the United Nations, we actually very seldom, or not sufficiently in my view, refer to this. If, for example, if we have the situation, and I will be very blunt, where three quarters of the victims of hate speech were, were for example, indigenous people, do you not think we would talk about this emphasize it and highlight it, highlight it very often. I think we would, but why are we not doing this at the level of the United Nations, I would say? Because more than three quarters, at least according to some of the data we have, of victims of hate speech in social media are minorities. It's not everyone being affected in the same way. On the difficult I would even say perhaps dangerous risks inherent in limiting freedom of expression to prevent hate speech, because that's really what we're talking about. Um, this is a dimension which I and other experts of the United Nations are extremely sensitive to, and which will hopefully be explored in more depth at the regional at, and United Nations forums, which I referred to. Obviously, it's a very complex issue. I don't have time to explore that uh, right now. But it has actually been mentioned in, in for example, just, just a few moments ago in the guidelines, uh, the Rabat guidelines, which Sejal uh, referred to. Beyond these information, well, it seems to me that there are a couple of other points that stand, stand out. One common thread I retain in the descriptions by this distinguished panel, panel is the inaction of authorities when confronting hate speech against minorities, the lack, the lack of prosecution. Um, and I think this is a central element. If legislation may be there, but if it's not enforced, we have to understand to find out why and try to address that directly. Uh, we have situations where civil society 
are trying to warn social media platform owners about uh, hashtag campaigns. Also, you have the, the challenge of camouflaging hate speech in what is, to use a colloquial expression, what, in what is a dog whistle strategies with words of coded meaning or even symbols with coded meaning. But as you can imagine, um, if, use of certain, uh, if you're in, um, in a minority, you're struggling to convince private owners that they should perhaps go against their own economic interests to do the right thing. It's one thing to emphasize the, the importance of certain fundamental principles, but sometimes there's the tensions between principles and the economic interests of owners of platforms. And I think we are a bit naive uh, if we do not recognize that this that can occur. Um, is legislation and coercion the only way to go or a way to go which would be privileged? Or in other words, should we hit them where it hurts, to use another colloquial expression, as is happening with Facebook right now and was referred to earlier. Um, I'm also concerned that in some countries, as Lisa mentioned, I think hate speech could be considered to be protected speech. In my view, um, international human rights law and obligations are quite clear that hate speech is not protected speech. I would say there are nuances, of course, but I would say no country is above the law, and that includes international law, despite what some political leaders may believe or claim. So do we need new laws or more the enforcement of ex existing laws? Should hate speech that constitutes incitement to discrimination, hostility and violence in international human rights law be prohibited? Is this enough? Is it the right balance in terms of uh, uh, dealing with hate speech? Um, there is much more that I could say, but I think we should have a bit of time left for uh, questions for participants. I just wanted to perhaps emphasize that there is no, obviously no easy answers, uh, but there are nevertheless good questions to ask if somehow these issues and particularly how to identify specifically that knowledge and address the scale of growing, increasing hate speech in social media against minorities. If there is ever going to be a hope to promote a dialogue and a respectful approach to the human rights challenges and even threats of those who face growing inequalities and vulnerability. vulnerability. Uh, and these in, in, in these in most parts of the world are clearly mainly minorities. So once again, my time is up. Thank you to everyone again for your involvement, assistance and participation. And once again, please stay safe and healthy. Bonne journée, merci. Thank you very much, sorry. Uh, now, speaking of um, good and relevant questions, I have a few of them for our participants. Um, I would like to start in reverse order and I would kindly ask all um, uh, speakers to be as short as they can. These are Im almost impossible questions to ask, but just give us a sense of how you see us going forward. Um, so I would start, as I said, in reverse order with Sajal and ask her the following. How can tech companies, in your opinion, do better work uh, in relation to the international community to counter hate speech and disinformation? You did mention that tech companies should incorporate international standards uh, on the question uh, for monitor the platforms, but how do you see that playing out given the jurisdictional issues? And in my personal uh, capacity, I would uh, also add given their conflicting business interests with the protection of hate speech. So, Okay, okay. Um, thanks. Um, just on the business side, um, it's true that um, viral hate, um, you know, does, does generate money for social media companies, um, um, obviously, but I think just in the last few days with, with, with the Stop the Hate campaign, we've seen, especially with the response of um, Mark Zuckerberg and senior officials, that they are sensitive to the business case when um, big companies um, do withdraw advertising funding, um, albeit for a, for, for a short time. Um, 
Um, okay, so what, so what should social media companies do? I mean, already there has been, as I said, this sort of um, intense flow of activity at the UN level, which um, has involved the engagement, strong engagement by um, various actors, um, including the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression and the Office on um, Genocide Prevention, uh, with whom I'm, I've been working very closely with over the last six months, um, to identify what are those um, responsibilities. Um, and those are in line, actually, with the guiding principles on business and human rights. Um, so um, first, um, they need to define what they consider hate speech consistently across jur jurisdictions. Um, um, now, um, you know, diff different jurisdictions have obviously different legal regimes. Um, uh, states block content, uh, take, take down content in a way which is uh, not conducive with international human rights law. And, um, and these, these companies do um, um, uh, follow those um, principles. So um, that, that is that is problematic, but where they where they can um, uh, apply international human rights law, um, specifically on uh, incitement, um, they should do so. Facebook is, for example, very well aware and, and knows well the Rabat uh, plan of action. In fact, it was Facebook that translated the um, six part threshold test of the Rabat plan of action um, into 32 languages very recently and you can find that on the um, UN Human Rights Office's website. Um, um, so uh, other um, uh, things that um, social media platforms should do is assess how their products and services affect human rights. Um, in other words, do human rights impact assessments. Um, ensure that um, in applying their hate speech policies, they should also evaluate the context and the harm um, of those policies on particular communities. Um, ensure that there is um, a human being in the loop um, for any use of automation or um, artificial intelligence tools. Um, and you know, on the point that I think um, Fernand was talking about in terms of the involvement of communities in these in these discussions with powerful social media platforms, you know, minority groups affected by hate speech absolutely should be involved in analyzing not only the context, um, which I just mentioned, but also identifying the most effective tools in addressing the harms. So um, there are um, a number of things that social media platforms um, uh, could do um, in relation to um, hate speech. But again, you know, all this is within an existing Yes, it's non-binding, but nonetheless, the business and human rights framework under the guiding principles is a powerful normative tool um, for um, anti-discrimination, uh, minority rights, and human rights advocates to use in order to um, challenge social media companies um, to um, uh, not only uh, say that they are uh, respecting um, human rights in a vague sense or freedom of expression, um, but in a very concrete and specific um, um, and uh, detailed sense when it comes to the nuances and specificities of international human rights law. Um, and as I said in my presentation and just kind of going back to what uh, Fernand was talking about hate speech and its relationship with um, international human rights law, you know, not all hate speech is um, uh, unlawful. Um, you know, there are certain types of hate speech which are lawful, but they still demand a response. Um, so the unlawful types of hate speech concern incitement, um, but also in certain circumstances, um, uh, types of expression which um, may be restricted, um, you know, in order to protect um, equality, for example, provided that they are um, meeting the, 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 the test of legality, um, necessity and proportionality under international human rights law. Thank you. Thank you, Sajal. Um, can I now turn now to Nihad? It was fascinating listening to you uh, expose all of the important parameters of the situation in Pakistan. Can you still say today, it, from your own trajectory and your own um, work, that internet is a safe zone for minorities to speak out against the injustice and discrimination that they face? Uh, and would you perhaps tell us a bit more of the biggest challenges that they still face in that respect? Right. Uh, so I'm. Um, uh, I think uh, I could say like if you would have asked me the same question a couple of years back, I I, I would have said that yes, internet still uh, slightly safe zone for minorities to uh, reclaim uh, online spaces, but uh, 
in this age and day, I feel that the way uh, different governments have come up with the regulations around internet uh, uh, in the form of cybercrime laws or existing laws that are also interpreted uh, not only for the online space, uh, offline space, but also for online space. I see that there is a lot of self-censorship by the minorities in the online space. They don't see, I mean, I'm, I'm talking from the Pakistani context. They don't see this uh, online as a space where they can speak safely or where they would feel that they are safe while openly talk about, like openly talking about their, uh, um, uh, the, the challenges that they face or so I think uh, uh, I, I mean just you know like recently we have released uh, our in 2019 um, uh, the uh, cyber harassment helpline report we have we run cyber harassment helpline in Pakistan for the last four years and it's just so sad and um, it's it's yeah I mean I had no words because uh, we received more than 2,000 complaints all over Pakistan, and there were only two or three complaints from minority groups. And that says a lot, you know, it's, you know, it says that they have a trust deficit, not just with the state authorities, but with the private bodies who are running these helplines or some supporting mechanisms. And that was a point you know that was a point where you know we were thinking that what are the ways that you know we are not a state we are a private non non-governmental body so why they are not reaching out to us you know what is the fear you know so so i think uh, the trust deficit uh, between the minorities and the state authorities between the minorities and the tech companies between the minorities and the support groups and also international bodies i feel that they feel that they are isolated. And the way cybercrime law in Pakistan has been misused in the last few years, uh, the space that they used to see that this is a space where they can speak uh, openly, they are not able to use internet as uh, openly as they used to. One more thing, there are like recent directive uh, by the Pakistan Telecommunication Authority that corporations and uh, businesses and individuals need to register their VPN with their local internet service provider. So the first question is, what is the use of them using VPN? Like, why would I go to the ISP and register myself that I'm using VPN? I mean, it actually kills the entire purpose of anonymity. And anonymity gives so much right to the minorities. I mean, that's the only way that they can use that space and then still, you know, raise the concerns. So they're like these things happening, which I'm, I feel that making uh, these spaces more, uh, you know, these like sh sh shrinking these spaces, not yeah. just offline, but online as well. Thank you very much. That's extremely important. The anonymity factor is something that we should seriously take into consideration in terms of its impact. Now, let me turn to uh, Leisha and ask her the following. How do you think in, 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 in a, in a short and concise way that the rise in authoritarianism in the US has further challenged minority communities? There's no simple uh, or quick answer to that. It's just in all sorts of ways. I mean, as we, as we monitor the rise in authoritarianism internationally, I think there's not enough attention about you know, the rise in, in authoritarianism in the US. And I think that, that we make a mistake when we don't identify it and call it out as authoritarianism. And I appreciate what the special rapporteur said about can no one is above kind of these standards or, or, or of international human rights laws. So um, it's, it's a threat. They have just ongoing threats to, and it, to democratic values. In, in the US and hopefully the movement we're currently in will begin to push back against that. We need the help of the international community in calling out the US um, and, our, and our rise in authoritarianism and anti-democratic values. Thank you very much. Um, last but certainly not least, can I ask Julius uh, to give us a sense uh, as to whether he sees, whether you see any potential for a large coalition of minorities against hate speech and what do you think that the Roma experience can contrib contribute into that? Uh, 
your microphone. You need to open your microphone. There are a few factors that um, might influence the potential for such a large coalition of minorities and let's say open-minded groups against hate speech. Uh, first, it depends of course on the leadership of different minority groups. If they can come together and uh, uh, defend uh, such a common interest. We, from our side, we noticed in different countries that even when some minority groups that are better positioned than Roma are, have the capacity to build such a coalition, they prefer to do it for their uh, own group and not to join with the others uh, in defending the collective interest. Of course, this depends on the political representation of uh, minorities, therefore the electoral system. In the case of the Roma, since they are what is uh, um, usually called a politically, a politically minor, uh, insular minority, a minority that doesn't have the power to become a, a, a voice in mainstream politics, then that's uh, very limited. Also depends on the leadership of the mainstream political parties and of the politicians as well. Uh, and here it's not only about a law creating a legal framework for um, uh, coercion yeah, and controlling that kind of behavior. It's also about having the right education. To me, it's fundamental that anti-racist training to be part of the mainstream curricula in all countries, because we are preparing not only uh, uh, robots or workers for the labor market, but we are preparing citizens in a, for a democratic society. So therefore, we have to build up those skills and values uh, that are uh, internalized by the citizens, by the future citizens, and that it is expressed later on in the way they interact with institutions, with they interact with other citizens, and so on. So it is uh, um, also a matter of building up an educational system that is forward-looking, uh, democracy-oriented, yeah, and that is uh, uh, also open to minorities. It's not just, it, just, it doesn't represent just an instrument for the majority populations to impose their own views, cultures, and language on the minorities. Uh, but all the, there are also other factors that are historical, yeah? Like, for example, recognizing the slavery of the Roma or, uh, you know, taking into account while designing policies, yeah, that part of historical discrimination of certain groups. That's fundamental if we want to achieve social inclusion, how it is called in European policies, yeah. So in European jargon, if we want all this, we have to have uh, also the kind of knowledge that goes back and uh, uh, to build on an inclusive society. Thank you very much. Um, uh, uh, another question, this time general to everyone, uh, which essentially goes more or less in the same direction as what has been discussed upon. We are gradually discovering a lot of convergence and similarities uh, with groups across the globe. So my question to you, to all of you is this, how do you think that solidarity among the different minority groups on the local, regional and international level can indeed contribute to the fight against hate speech in more effective ways? Do you see uh, that su such kind of solidarity exists from your own perspectives. Um, can I again start with Sajal? Uh, I would also ask speakers to be extremely brief in the interest of time so that we give everyone the opportunity to say something. Thank you. Um, question is, um, are transnational solidarity networks useful? Um, do they exist? I think, you know, right back to the, you know, abolitionist movement, you know, in the, 
you know, 18th century and, 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 and in the um, late 17th century, I think that transnational movements um, uh, against um, uh, discrimination um, have existed um, and they are they are current today. I mean, we see that now with Black Lives Matter, which is not only a, a national movement in the United States, but to spur um, uh, anti-racism movements um, across the world. So um, I think the connection between civil societies is crucial um, and exists um, and is a real sort of driving force and energy, um, you know, behind, uh, um, you know, behind certain changes, but, but obviously those changes haven't gone far enough, um, you know, with respect to uh, states policies, um, but also um, in regard to social media policies, you know, whether those transnational movements actually have um, lasting and deep impact as they seek and justifiably so is, is still um, a question that needs to be needs to be answered. But I, th I think the, the energy is very positive. And I think that now is a real sort of turning point an inflection point as someone says, said before, you know, never in my um, life, um, and, you know, has, has there been such an energy around anti-racism in particular. Um, but I think this, this can be built on by minority rights movements as well. Um, particularly, for example, in, in Europe, um, the Roma rights movement can draw upon that positive energy. Thank you, Sajal. What is your take, Nihad, on this? I would just like to mention one very positive event that just took place around international solidarities. It was between uh, a Shidi community in Pakistan, uh, a Dalit community from India, and, um, and uh, a Black uh, uh, community from US. So Dr. Cornel West uh, and um, uh, Azad uh, um, is uh, just uh, Chandrasekhar Azad from India and uh, Tanzila Kamrani, who is a Shidi, who's a, from a minority and a Shidi uh, community, and she's an MPA uh, in, in Sen. So they three sat together, and it was such a powerful conversation around international solidarities and cross-border solidarity uh, solidarities uh, among minorities. And I would just like people to watch this. I have just posted the link in the chat. I think this is one example where how we can all, uh, especially from the minority uh, communities, they can join hands together. Thank you, Nihad. Um, Julius, oh, sorry, Lisha. I, I agree, I'm very hopeful. And as Sajal mentioned, it's always happened. And I think that, that we allow ourselves to be convinced that it's not possible and doesn't happen. And that is because people who are pushing the authoritarian agenda or anti-democratic agenda are also trying to use us as wedges against one another. And, and that keeps us from coming together. But there are movements afoot. Um, Dr. William Barber, who leads the um, Poor People's Campaign, in the US has been doing that and, and multi-issue organizing is the key to, to long-term change. And I think that people are beginning to recognize that. We see it you know, in, in the COVID, people coming together, standing up uh, for Asian and Pacific Islanders as, as they continue to be the target of racial oppression. And, and that same group or coalition working now um, advancing the Black Lives Matter movement. There's been more done on LGBT rights, especially LGBTQ rights, especially as it pertains to trans issues. There's just a lot of positive energy and people coming together across, across separate interest groups like never before. So we have to push back against those wedges that would have us work against one another. And Julius? I, uh, I'd say, uh, yes, I'm a, 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 an optimistic person uh, in general. And my example is Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Uh, the support it enjoys all over the world these days, it's something fantastic, yeah? Uh, to even, you know, one year ago, nobody would have thought about something like that, that so many diverse groups would come to support all over the world. Uh, Black Lives Matter. And under uh, this movement, also uh, um, other groups are trying to feed, uh, you know, uh, um, their claims for equality and social justice. I think that's uh, um, something that we have to look into to learn and um, why not to act for a better uh, society. 
for a better life. And I have reserved the final couple of minutes to the special UN Special Rapporteur to give us his thoughts as to whether he thinks there is any hope here. You've, um, you've given me hope, uh, as a matter of fact, because I think your observations in relation to the potential for civil society to work together and minority organizations around the world to work together uh, shows through the Black Lives Matter movement that even uh, during the sometimes the darkest nights, and I do believe that currently around the world, we are experiencing huge challenges. The rise of authoritarianism has been mentioned. The rise also of uh, exclusive nationalism in different parts of the world. Uh, sometimes we can get rather discouraged by all of that. But I think what we've heard in the closing uh, remarks is uh, very powerful and insightful uh, contributions and possibilities. And I'm very, very pleased that we can end uh, this webinar on that kind of positive note. Um, hope remains and from hope, we can perhaps build a better future for all of us, particularly those who are vulnerable, uh, such as minorities. Thank you. So um, I would like to take now this opportunity to thank all of you. This has been a very enriching um, exchange of views for your contributions, for your patience, for keeping the time. Uh, and I would also like to thank our audience for sending us some very interesting questions uh, and for their participation. However, uh, my thanking would be incomplete if I did not um, address it also to the TLI team, the Tom Lantosh Institute team. Uh, in particular, Shane Waller, Evelyn Verhas, and Marcus Oda, who have made this webinar and all the others in the same series uh, possible. Um, in concluding, I would like to just briefly uh, explain to you where the recording of this webinar can be viewed. Uh, there are several places. The first is the Tom Lantos Institute's YouTube page. Uh, then the other option would be the Tom Lantos Institute's Facebook page. Uh, and third, their own website. You can also see this uh, under www.minorityforum.info. And also it will be stored in the video archives of the School of Advan Advanced Study of the University of London. My final, final task is to announce the following webinar in this same series, which will deal with the interrelationship between conflicts, minority rights, and the promotion of inclusiveness and stability. This will happen uh, on Thursday, the 9th of July at 2.30 Central European uh, time. So thank you all. Uh, and thank you also to our, your, to our audience for uh, listening.